chapter six of three contributions to the theory of sex this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org three contributions to the theory of sex by sigmund freud translated by abraham arden brill eighteen seventy four to nineteen forty eight chapter six the infantile sexuality the sexual latency period of childhood and its interruptions manifestations of the infantile sexuality the sexual aim of the infantile sexuality the infantile sexuality it is a part of popular belief about the sexual impulse that it is absent in childhood and that it first appears in the period of life known as puberty this though a common error is serious in its consequences and is chiefly due to our present ignorance of the fundamental principles of the sexual life a comprehensive study of the sexual manifestations of childhood would probably reveal to us the existence of the essential features of the sexual impulse and would make us acquainted with its development and its composition from various sources the neglect of the infantile it is remarkable that those writers who endeavour to explain the qualities and reactions of the adult individual have given so much more attention to the ancestral period than to the period of the individual's own existence that is they have attributed more influence to heredity than to childhood as a matter of fact it might well be supposed that the influence of the latter period would be easier to understand and that it would be entitled to more consideration than heredity to be sure one occasionally finds in medical literature notes on the premature sexual activities of small children about erections and masturbation and even actions resembling coitus but these are referred to merely as exceptional occurrences as curiosities or as deterring examples of premature perversity no author has to my knowledge recognized the normality of the sexual impulse in childhood and in the numerous writings on the development of the child the chapter on sexual development is usually passed over infantile amnesia this remarkable negligence is due partly to conventional considerations which influence the writers on account of their own bringing up and partly to a psychic phenomenon which has thus far remained unexplained i refer to the peculiar amnesia which veils from most people not from all the first years of their childhood usually the first six or eight years so far it has not occurred to us that this amnesia ought to surprise us though we have good reasons for surprise for we are informed that in those years from which we later obtain nothing except a few incomprehensible memory fragments we have vividly reacted to impressions that we have manifested pain and pleasure like any human being that we have evinced love jealousy and other passions as they then affected us indeed we are told that we have uttered remarks which proved to grown-ups that we possessed understanding and a budding power of judgment still we know nothing of all this when we become older why does our memory lag behind all our other psychic activities we really have reason to believe that at no time of life are we more capable of impressions and reproductions than during the years of childhood on the other hand we must assume or we may convince ourselves through psychological observations on others that the very impressions which we have forgotten have nevertheless left the deepest traces in our psychic life and acted as determinants for our whole future development we conclude therefore that we do not deal with a real forgetting of infantile impressions but rather with an amnesia similar to that observed in neurotics for later experiences the nature of which consists in their being detained from consciousness repression but what forces bring about this repression of the infantile impressions he who can solve this riddle will also explain hysterical amnesia 
we shall not however hesitate to assert that the existence of the infantile amnesia gives us a new point of comparison between the psychic states of the child and those of the psychoneurotic we have already encountered another point of comparison when confronted by the fact that the sexuality of the psychoneurotic preserves the infantile character or has returned to it may there not be an ultimate connection between the infantile and the hysterical amnesias the connection between the infantile and the hysterical amnesias is really more than a mere play of wit the hysterical amnesia which serves the repression can only be explained by the fact that the individual already possesses a sum of recollections which have been withdrawn from conscious disposal and which by associative connection now sees that which is acted upon by the repelling forces of the repression emanating from consciousness we may say that without infantile amnesia there would be no hysterical amnesia i believe that the infantile amnesia which causes the individual to look upon his childhood as if it were a prehistoric time and conceals from him the beginning of his own sexual life that this amnesia is responsible for the fact that one does not usually attribute any value to the infantile period in the development of the sexual life one single observer cannot fill the gap which has been thus produced in our knowledge as early as eighteen ninety six i had already emphasized the significance of childhood for the origin of certain important phenomena connected with the sexual life and since then i have not ceased to put into the foreground the importance of the infantile factor for sexuality the sexual latency period of childhood and its interruptions the extraordinary frequent discoveries of apparently abnormal and exceptional sexual manifestations in childhood as well as the discovery of infantile reminiscences in neurotics which were hitherto unconscious allow us to sketch the following picture of the sexual behavior of childhood it seems certain that the newborn child brings with it the germs of sexual feelings which continue to develop for some time and then succumb to a progressive suppression which is in turn broken through by the proper advances of the sexual development and which can be checked by individual idiosyncrasies nothing is known concerning the laws and periodicity of this oscillating course of development it seems however that the sexual life of the child mostly manifests itself in the third or fourth year in some form accessible to observation the sexual inhibition it is during this period of total or at least partial latency that the psychic forces develop which later act as inhibitions on the sexual life and narrow its direction like dams these psychic forces are loathing shame and moral and aesthetic ideal demands we may gain the impression that the erection of these dams in the civilized child is the work of education and surely education contributes much to it in reality however this development is organically determined and can occasionally be produced without the help of education indeed education remains properly within its assigned realm only if it strictly follows the path of the organic determinant and impresses it somewhat cleaner and deeper reaction formation and sublimation what are the means that accomplish these very important constructions so significant for the later personal culture and normality they are probably brought about at the cost of the infantile sexuality itself the influx of which has not stopped even in this latency period the energy of which indeed has been turned away either wholly or partially from sexual utilization and conducted to other aims the historians of civilization seem to be unanimous in the opinion that such deviation of sexual motive powers from sexual aims to new aims a process which merits the name of sublimation has furnished powerful components for all cultural accomplishments 
we will therefore add that the same process acts in the development of every individual and that it begins to act in the sexual latency period we can also venture an opinion about the mechanisms of such sublimation the sexual feelings of these infantile years on the one hand could not be utilizable since the procreating functions are postponed this is the chief character of the latency period on the other hand they would in themselves be perverse as they would emanate from erogenous zones and would be born of impulses which in the individual's course of development could only evoke a feeling of displeasure they therefore awaken contrary forces feelings of reaction which in order to suppress such displeasure build up the above-mentioned psychic dams loathing shame and morality the interruptions of the latency period without deluding ourselves as to the hypothetical nature and deficient clearness of our understanding regarding the infantile period of latency and delay we will return to reality and state that such a utilization of the infantile sexuality represents an ideal bringing up from which the development of the individual usually deviates in some measure and often very considerably a portion of the sexual manifestation which has withdrawn from sublimation occasionally breaks through or a sexual activity remains throughout the whole duration of the latency period until the reinforced breaking through of the sexual impulse in puberty in so far as they have paid any attention to infantile sexuality the educators behave as if they shared our views concerning the formation of the moral forces of defence at the cost of sexuality and as if they knew that sexual activity makes the child uneducable for the educators consider all sexual manifestations of the child as an evil in the face of which little can be accomplished we have however every reason for directing our attention to those phenomena so much feared by the educators for we expect to find in them the solution of the primitive formation of the sexual impulse the manifestations of the infantile sexuality for reasons which we shall discuss later we will take as a model of the infantile sexual manifestations thumb-sucking pleasure sucking to which the hungarian pediatrist lindner has devoted an excellent essay thumb sucking thumb sucking which manifests itself in the nursing baby and which may be continued till maturity or throughout life consists in a rhythmic repetition of sucking contact with the mouth the lips wherein the purpose of taking nourishment is excluded a part of the lip itself the tongue which is another preferable skin region within reach and even the big toe may be taken as objects for sucking simultaneously there is also a desire to grasp things which manifests itself in a rhythmical pulling of the ear-lobe and which may cause the child to grasp a part of another person generally the ear for the same purpose the pleasure sucking is connected with an entire exhaustion of attention and leads to sleep or even to a motor reaction in the form of an orgasm pleasure sucking is often combined with a rubbing contact with certain sensitive parts of the body such as the breast and external genitals it is by this road that many children go from thumb sucking to masturbation lindner himself has recognized the sexual nature of this action and openly emphasized it in the nursery thumb-sucking is often treated in the same way as any other sexual naughtiness of the child a very strong objection was raised against this view by many pediatrists and neurologists which in part is certainly due to the confusion of the terms sexual and genital this contradiction raises the difficult question which cannot be rejected namely in what general traits do we wish to recognize the sexual manifestations of the child i believe that the association of the manifestations into which we gained an insight through psychoanalytic investigation justify us in claiming thumb-sucking as a sexual activity and in studying through it the essential features of the infantile sexual activity autoerotism 
it is our duty here to arrange this state of affairs differently let us insist that the most striking character of this sexual activity is that the impulse is not directed against other persons but that it gratifies itself on its own body to use the happy term invented by havelock ellis we will say that it is autoerotic it is moreover clear that the action of the thumb-sucking child is determined by the fact that it seeks a pleasure which has already been experienced and is now remembered through the rhythmic sucking on a portion of the skin or mucous membrane it finds the gratification in the simplest way it is also easy to conjecture on what occasions the child first experienced this pleasure which it now strives to renew the first and most important activity in the child's life the sucking from the mother's breast or its substitute must have acquainted it with this pleasure we would say that the child's lips behaved like an erogenous zone and that the excitement through the warm stream of milk was really the cause of the pleasurable sensation to be sure the gratification of the erogenous zone was at first united with the gratification of taking nourishment he who sees a satiated child sink back from the mother's breast and fall asleep with reddened cheeks and blissful smile will have to admit that this picture remains as typical of the expression of sexual gratification in later life but the desire for repetition of the sexual gratification is separated from the desire for taking nourishment a separation which becomes unavoidable with the appearance of the teeth when the nourishment is no longer sucked in but chewed the child does not make use of a strange object for sucking but prefers its own skin because it is more convenient because it thus makes itself independent of the outer world which it cannot yet control and because in this way it creates for itself as it were a second even if an inferior erogenous zone the inferiority of this second region urges it later to seek the same parts the lips of another person it is a pity that i cannot kiss myself might be attributed to it not all children suck their thumbs it may be assumed that it is found only in children in whom the erogenous significance of the lip zone is constitutionally reinforced children in whom this is retained are habitual kissers as adults and show a tendency to perverse kissing or as men they have a marked desire for drinking and smoking but if repression comes into play they experience disgust for eating and evince hysterical vomiting by virtue of the community of the lip zone the repression encroaches upon the impulse of nourishment many of my female patients showing disturbances in eating such as hysterical globus choking sensations and vomiting have been energetic thumb-suckers during infancy in the thumb-sucking or pleasure-sucking we have already been able to observe the three essential characters of an infantile sexual manifestation the latter has its origin in conjunction with a bodily function which is very important for life it does not yet know any sexual object it is autoerotic and its sexual aim is under the control of an erogenous zone let us assume for the present that these characters also hold true for most of the other activities of the infantile sexual impulse the sexual aim of the infantile sexuality the characters of the erogenous zones from the example of thumb-sucking we may gather a great many points useful for the distinguishing of an erogenous zone it is a portion of skin or mucous membrane in which the stimuli produce a feeling of pleasure of definite quality there is no doubt that the pleasure-producing stimuli are governed by special determinants which we do not know the rhythmic characters must play some part in them and this strongly suggests an analogy to tickling it does not however appear so certain whether the character of the pleasurable feeling evoked by the stimulus can be designated as peculiar and in what part of this peculiarity the sexual factor exists psychology is still groping in the dark when it concerns matters of pleasure and pain and the most cautious assumption is therefore the most advisable 
we may perhaps later come upon reasons which seem to support the peculiar quality of the sensation of pleasure the erogenous quality may adhere most notably to definite regions of the body as is shown by the example of thumb-sucking there are predestined erogenous zones but the same example also shows that any other region of skin or mucous membrane may assume the function of an erogenous zone it must therefore carry along a certain adaptability the production of the sensation of pleasure therefore depends more on the quality of the stimulus than on the nature of the bodily region the thumb-sucking child looks around on his body and selects any portion of it for pleasure sucking and becoming accustomed to it he then prefers it if he accidentally strikes upon a predestined region such as breast nipple or genitals it naturally has the preference a quite analogous tendency to displacement is again found in the symptomatology of hysteria in this neurosis the repression mostly concerns the genital zones proper these in turn transmit their excitation to the other erogenous zones usually dormant in mature life which then behave exactly like genitals but besides this just as in thumb-sucking any other region of the body may become endowed with the excitation of the genitals and raised to an erogenous zone erogenous and hysterogenous zones show the same characters the infantile sexual aim the sexual aim of the infantile impulse consists in the production of gratification through the proper excitation of this or that selected erogenous zone in order to leave a desire for its repetition this gratification must have been previously experienced and we may be sure that nature has devised definite means so as not to leave this occurrence to mere chance the arrangement which has fulfilled this purpose for the lip zone we have already discussed it is the simultaneous connection of this part of the body with the taking of nourishment we shall also meet other similar me mechanisms as sources of sexuality the state of desire for repetition of gratification can be recognized through a peculiar feeling of tension which in itself is rather of a painful character and through a centrally determined feeling of itching or sensitiveness which is projected into the peripheral erogenous zone the sexual aim may therefore be formulated as follows the chief object is to substitute for the projected feeling of sensitiveness in the erogenous zone that outer stimulus which removes the feeling of sensitiveness by evoking the feeling of gratification this external stimulus consists usually in a manipulation which is analogous to sucking it is in full accord with our physiological knowledge if the desire happens to be awakened also peripherally through an actual change in the erogenous zone the action is puzzling only to some extent as one stimulus for its suppression seems to want another applied to the same place End of chapter 6